Nick, it's it's a it's an honour to have you on MLST. Um, we are at your house in Oxford, so I had to drive up from Ascot today. But um, yeah, um, just welcome welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much, Tim. It's lovely to be here. Wonderful. So um, one of my um, Discord community members uh, recommended to me last week that I should check out your other book as well and have a chat with you about that first. And that book is called The Mind is Flat. And it's really, really interesting, actually. It, it echoes many of the things that I have been thinking about, but perhaps didn't articulate quite as clearly, particularly after speaking with Daniel Dennett recently, um, because he spoke about this mm. intentional stance. But maybe yep. we'll, we'll yep. get there in a minute. But you started off in the book um, discussing Tolstoy and even Tolkien. And yep. you, you sketched out what happened to Anna Karenina. Um, at the end of the story, so could, can you start there? Yes, I, I don't want to do too many too many spoilers for people who haven't read the read the book. But <laughs> um, but um, yes, yeah, so the the, 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 the climax of, of Anna Karenina is the uh, her her leap leap under a train in a in a, in a Russian station, probably outside, on the outskirts of Moscow somewhere. I just can't remember the details. Um, and and the question is why? You know, what 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 is it that leads her to this terrible um, terrible end? And um, the natural answer is to think, well, there must be an answer to that in context of her, her beliefs and her so expectations about the future, her sense that you know, my relationship with, with Vronsky has failed, this whole thing's a mistake, and I, you know, my, my, my marriage is broken down with my husband, and you know, what am I going to do with my, my child? And just the whole, how everything is falling apart and she's becoming a pariah in, in Russian society. So there must be some sort of story, and we could tell that story, and if we could look inside her head closely enough, we'd be able to work out exactly what was it, what were the, the key triggers that made her jump then? Um, and I want to suggest in the book that that that's, that's really wrong. Um, it, it, of course, there are motive forces driving driving her to a desperate act. But if you were to imagine asking her, just as, as she's about to make the fatal leap, you know, can, can you just quickly run through what the issues are here? She'd really struggle to tell you. She'd, you know, she'd say, well, I, I'm desperate. I mean, I'm very unhappy. I, I feel you know, there's no hope. Uh, why exactly? Well, you get, you get some salad of stuff, but it wouldn't be a particularly coherent one. If you asked her several times, you'd get different answers. Um, and the thought would be that, uh, the, sort of the intuitive thought, the sort of uh, the, the starting point for lots of thinking in psychology and indeed economics, where actually there's a kind of very strong um, sense that people are very rational and their if, if, if their actions are driven by that, that their, their values and their, their beliefs. That there's a sense that there ought to be some true answer. If she may give you a rather incoherent answer, but mm. you know, there really is underneath everything. There's a tr true answer. So the um, the idea would be that supposing supposing she, supposing she survived. Um, miraculously, he doesn't actually get mown down by the train, um, and, and she's uh, convalescing. And you say, "Well, actually, now, now we can really get to the bottom of it. We've got the time. You know, we can we can talk you through it. We can give you questionnaires. We can brain scan your brain. Would there be any way to reconstruct the the true answer? And I think the chance of what her motives were. And I think the answer again is, I want at least to, to give you the intuition, or give the reader the intuition that maybe not. Actually, um, it's not really the case that. Um, the, the this kind of true story. As we're going through our lives, we're continually inventing stories about why we're feeling as we're feeling and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, but the stories are sort of coming rather late in the day. So even at the trivial level of, um, yeah, sort of, I, I don't know, something doing something like um, you know, going to the fridge. You find just if you had to explain why we're doing that, I, do, I know what it is. Uh, I want I want some coffee and I need my the milk's in the fridge. So that's yeah. the explanation. But it's sort of a bit bogus to think. Well, I'd, I'd thought all that through, you know, I'd, I'd just you know, worked out a plan and part of my plan was going to the fridge. I just found myself setting off or setting off to turn on the coffee pot or turn on the tap or whatever it is. Um, so the, the, the story comes after, and I want to say that's true, it, it's sort of everywhere. I mean, like we, we, our behavior is generally too quick for us to tell the story um, beforehand, as it were. I mean, if you're playing tennis, I say, you're you know, charging about the court, reacting to all sorts of you know, subtleties of the, what's happening to the opponent, opponent's play. Um, you, you can tell a story about, oh, well, I thought they were quite weak on the backhand, or I, if I tried to cross court, I'd definitely you know, not be able to execute a shot. You can tell that story retrospectively, but yeah, you kind of know it's retrospective and, and a rationalization. Um, so the thought is that 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 sort of patter we give ourselves about why we do what we do, um, it's always rationalization. It's always retrospective. And Anna Karenina, even in this most desperate and extreme of states, is ju in just that kind of state. And I think any of us who've been, we all have in extreme emotional states, it's exactly the kind of situation where you might do something drastic, but you don't really know why you're doing it and you're as puzzled as anybody else. 
Um, so I suppose the, the sort of insight, um, if you know, the, the, the insight of pushing um, here, which is not by no, any means unique to me, it's very much a in some ways a standard perspective in social psychology and, uh, and, and aspects of philosophy. Daniel Dennett um, has been talking about this kind of thing for you know, many, many yes. decades, very, very yes. lucidly. Um, yeah, so the idea is that you don't have any deep insight into your own mind. You're creating stories about your own behavior as you're going along. Um, you shouldn't take those particularly seriously. They, they should be listened to and thought about, but really because they're helping you form um, a vision of who you are and what you want to do next, rather than they are actually, as it were, burrowing back into the brain processes that led you to act. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I've been speaking a lot with um, uh, Professor Carl Friston, and I interviewed um, one of his PhD students, Thomas Parr, uh, on Wednesday, and he's just written a book all about active inference. And um, I mean, I, I guess that there's a line of thinking here around thinking of the brain as a kind of prediction machine. And, um, you know, so perception as inference is roughly what you're speaking mm -hmm. about in the book. Yeah. But obviously yeah. it, it goes on to thinking about action and planning as inference. And, I, you know, I think like the, the punchline of, of this book, The Mind is Flat, is that um, explanations are a kind of inference. And um, there's this famous thought experiment in the world of deep learning called the Shoggoth. Um, it, it's a story from kind of Lovecraftian horror fiction that you have this horrible tentacled monster and nobody understands how the monster works and it has a smiley face on the front and that's what RLA mm. chef is, mm. you know, to help us kind of understand or bend the behavior of language models to suit our preferences. But um, our brain is a bit like the Shoggoth in, in a way. Yes. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So we, we tend to think that other people are a bit, mis are a bit mysterious um, but we should think our own brains were just as mysterious as anybody else's brain. And in fact, the fact, the fact, the fact that it's possible to, to create any kind of rationalized stories about anybody's behavior, including oneself, is a, is a bit of a miracle. But they are rationalized explanations. They are these, um, yes, they're not, it's not that you've somehow penetrated the deep workings of the deep, um, the, the, the deep learning system inside your head. I mean, how would that even work? I mean, the, you know, the complexity and the, you know, this gigantic sort of cooperative parallel computation you know, it, it, the idea that you could somehow capture that by saying, oh, actually, um, that you know, complex pattern of activity, that's the belief that uh, things have become too desperate to go on. And there is the uh, the desire for you know, oblivion or the desire to go on with life. Or, I mean, it's completely crazy, really. Uh, the, you know, obviously, you could say, well, there's a levels of explanation thing. Maybe at some higher level, the, some sort of pattern of neural activity could have this higher level of interpretation. But when people actually build complicated um, learning models like you know, large language models, there's certainly no sign that you can read off in some direct way um, how they're how they're operating. And, and of course, another nice thing about the world of large language models, which came a bit after uh, the mind is flat, um, so I, I, I missed a trick there um, because these there are sort of wonderful illustration exactly of this of this kind of point so you you can you you, you ask a large language model a question it will give you an answer you can say well why do you say that and you know yeah. what's and it'll give you an answer to that too but you'll be kidding yourself if you think that the large language model is quickly having a quick look inside its own processing uh, history and saying oh yes why did i say that? let me look inside no it's just another improvisation so, so the key concepts i think which um which comes up in, in the mind is flat, and also, of course, in the language game, um, which we'll be talking about later, um, is that is is that humans are spectacular improvisers, mm. uh, and we're so good at improvising, we are. So we often give us have a, have the sense that we must just be reading off the truth. So we're sort of novelists thinking we're jur doing journalism. So we're sort of making up stories and thinking, well, I, I, I can't, you know, it just came to me that story. It must be that must be how I really do feel. You know, I must have been feeling that all along. Um, that sort of sense of you know, revelation. I said, suddenly you, you blurt something out and you think, that's what you've been that's what you've been feeling all this time, isn't it? You think, well, <laughs> not really. I just made it up. <laughs> and tomorrow I'll make the opposite thing up. And you know, we are inchoate, inchoate sort of um, mushes. And you know, our rationalizations are attempt to try and put sense and organization onto what is you know, really a very mysterious uh, mysterious underlying system, which we, you know, we don't, you know, we, our brains are far too complex for us to understand. Yes, I mean, I've, I've spoken with many people who try to um, come up with some kind of a clear difference between us and machines. 
And a lot of the, um, the the language model people say, oh, you know, you're you're just the same. We're the same. I spoke with Max Bennett. He's got a, a book out about intelligence, and he said that you know the brain is is a simulation machine, and we do self modeling because we have this a granular prefrontal cortex, which you know can actually model ourselves, and then we can change the pointer, and we can have a theory of mind and model other people in this Daniel mm. Dennett esque sense. But as you are sketching out in, I think it's around chapter six of the book, there was this thing about, well, imagine there was a, a wireframe cube mm. and imagine what would happen if you kind of put a plane against three of the coordinates of, of the cube yep. and imagine what kind of shadow it would it would cast on the floor. And when we do these kind of experiments, we realize just how incoherent and inconsistent yep. our simulations of the world are. But, but, the, but the, the trick is, that's what it is. It is yep. a simulation. All we're yep. doing is we're just running these trajectories in the moment. And yep. when we when we articulate them and, and we actually just stand back and just think, what did I just say? It, it just doesn't make any sense. No, no. No, I think these these quick cases of imagery are really interesting because, uh, as you say, if you take a, uh, a sort of simple piece of a simple geometric thing like a cube and you imagine, well, I, you know, I must be able to imagine how that works because after all, I, I can imagine you know, whole elephants and whole roomfuls of, of people. So surely try to imagine the, the shape and structure of a cube would be easy. But actually, as you say, um, if you try to do simple, simple, um, simple, uh, thought experiments if you find you can't do them. in fact jeffrey hinton um obviously one of the the key pioneers of, yes. of deep learning and uh, he did a very early um, and very interesting paper on exactly this he has a paper on, i think 1979 in the journal of cognitive science i think that's roughly the right reference um where he talks about um essentially the the incredible shallowness and um uh, weakness of, of, of human inference with with examples of things like uh, cubes being viewed from odd positions. So, for example, there's a there's an angle you can look at a cube from. So it's a, the, where it suddenly looks like a, a hexagonal pinwheel. So it's a hexagon with little made up of little, little triangles. And it, in fact, if you look at a hexagonal pinwheel, you can find if you look at it enough, it suddenly looks like a cube. You think, oh my goodness, there's a three D object. I've suddenly seen how that could be a cube. So your brain is kind of able to to, to spot um, that this has, is a possible interpretation. But I would you know in, invite invite everybody to to try to imagine moving a wireframe cube around in your mind and try and turn it into that yeah. that pinwheel. Sh and you'll, you know, I think you'll never do it. Um, so yeah, I, so yeah, our, 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 yeah, our, our, our um. The thing is, our stimulations of the world are very momentary and, and, and fragmentary, and they are local. So we've got lots and lots of you know bits of experience of, of the world, and we've got lots of ways of extrapolating from it. If you then say, how do how do all those extrapolations tie together into one uber model of everything? The answer is, well, they don't. They don't. They, <laughs> they are incoherent. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is one of the themes, and we'll get on to the language model, um, uh, the language game book in, in, in a minute as well. But um, the world is gnarly. It's just more complicated than we could ever possibly yeah. understand. And in my opinion, intelligence is about building models to um, explain as much of that cone around us with as much consistency as possible mm -hmm. but it's a bit like the no free lunch theorem you know you, you need to have uh, lots and lots of models because no one model is going to get going to work in in all different cases you're coming at this i think from the direction of connectionism i think in, yeah. in the mind is yeah. flat and you're of course um, mm. citing hinton and this is in contrast to let's say psychology where we try to build these abstract consistent models of, of how the mind mm -hmm. works and and the key is is the word consistency i think there are many folks in in ai and even mathematics mm. who you know dared to believe mm. that the world was a consistent yep. place and and could be defined using mathematical structures and i think one of the the kind of lessons of, of the last 50 years or so is that's just not the case yeah, I think that's right. I mean, you can only only describe very local bits of the world in a consistent way. So it's a kind of tremendous miracle when any consistent piece of mathematics turns out to describe some tiny um, sliver of reality. So one that I'm very fond of, because I've been doing a bit of work with it recently, is um, in an indirect kind of way, is thermodynamics. So thermodynamics, yeah. wonderful. It's amazing that it's possible to, to think about heat and work and and there's a concept of entropy, which is always increasing or at least not decreasing. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's just astonishing that, that this, this way of seeing the world turns out to predict a lot of stuff very accurately. Um, but it doesn't explain everything. It just sees the world through a particular prism. And miraculously, it turns out there's a very clean way of, sort of understanding what's going on when you look through that prism. Um, and that's generally the way I think science is. So we, we try to find 
any squinting way you can look at the world so that patterns emerge. And when they do, uh, that's you know, ma massive progress and it's very important. But we mustn't forget that almost everything is not like that. I mean, the, the amount of thing we, things where we, there is a consistent tractable theory of universal application is, is vanishingly small. And the gnarly, uh, sort of in, in fractally complicated nature of the world is, is, the, def is the default. Um, and of course, in some sense, it's bound to be the case that we can't, um, we can't, we can't model the world in, in any decent way in our own heads, partly because um, obviously the, the world is much larger than we are. So that would be very strange. And also other people are in it. So, um, so obviously I can't be modeling you if you're modeling me. I mean, we're off in some kind of horrible infinite regress straight away. So it's always going to, you know, inevitably going to be a matter of extreme approximation. And almost everything, what was miraculous, I suppose, about human intelligence or intelligence in general is the ability to cope pretty well with a world that's way too complex to really understand. Um, so it's kind of, and we have to be doing that by you know, working up to a large extent by analogy from experiences and um, things we've already, already seen and learned about. We can't be trying to drive all the way back to a sort of axiomatic, consistent framework because that's going to be only possible in a tiny number of cases. But even if it were possible, you know, it's, we're, we're never gonna, you're never going to get there in you know, some sort of finite amount of time. You know, each, each child has to learn to understand the physical world. Each child is not going to infer Newtonian dynamics or thermodynamics from scratch in the first two years of life. Yes, I mean, I, I suppose it's interesting that we were capable of producing a model which is reasonably consistent, let's say the mm -hmm. Newtonian model. But no, I, I really agree with what you're saying that I've spoken with many physicists recently who are trying to conceive of life and intelligence using thermodynamic descriptions. Mm -hmm. And there seems to be a hierarchy of resolution. So of course, there's like dynamics, and then there's behavior, which is roughly where machine learning people operate. And then there's function, which is where psychology mm -hmm. operates. And there seems to be various trade offs when you go to all of these different levels. And uh, of course, there are some folks who say, well, no, you know, things like consciousness are outside of those three. They're, yeah. they're, they're something yeah. a little bit extra. But when you do go to the highest resolution and talk about dynamics, um, it almost becomes a useless theory because when you look at dynamical systems, there's no such thing as causality. Physics equations don't have the notion of causality. You can reverse time and it wouldn't make any, mm. any difference. And also it no longer um, brightly divides the phenomena that you're interested in. So if you say, well, all life is just dynamics, then, well, what's the difference mm. between living things and non-living things? Can't tell you. Yes. I mean, it's true. I think there's just a general point, which you're absolutely right to, to, uh, to highlight here, which is that we're, we're all attracted, and I certainly am, by abstract frameworks. But the danger of excess, excess um, enthusiasm for abstract frameworks is you then abstract away from the things that actually matter. Yeah. So as you say, you suddenly, and a really abstract framework for understanding life might, it might very, you know, may, may absolutely be something where you want to say, um, using simple physical principles which are the you know, so there's no magic there's no elan vital there's no sort of magical life force um under like with, with simple physical principles we want to explain you know, how cells work or how you know how bodies work that's sort of right um but it's very unlikely you're going to do that without any um with, with the conclusion that well you know life's pretty much like rocks it really really isn't like rocks and what you're going to have to do is understand that what deep new principles have arisen um, which allow you know self-organization or whatever it, whatever it is, which allow you know li life to be possible, and say I, I suspect the same is true with you know complicated thoughts and consciousness. Obviously, is a completely mysterious thing, um, but it would be it would, yes, it'd be, it'd be wrong to think that just by abstracting away, one's kind of solved the problem. One's got to then within with that one's abstract framework have a sense of oh right, so um, you know life what's special about life is this or what's special about conscious things that we're conscious of is this thing over here and and of course as you do that you might then blur the distinction you have started with you might say oh consciousness isn't quite what we thought or some things are alive that we thought weren't alive or you know we might start to wonder about you know are viruses alive and all that kind of thing those those boundary cases start to get re renegotiated um but but yes, the idea that you can just abstract abstract enough and all the problems go away. So it's terribly appealing. I fall, I fall into that trap all the time. Uh, but I, I try to extract myself. <laughs> yes, in, indeed. indeed. I mean, it's quite interesting in, in parallel. I mean, I, I interviewed David Chalmers and he's got a book called Reality Plus and he's talking about virtual worlds and whether they can be real, whether, you know, seen as real and yeah. whether yeah. they could be seen as having um, moral value. And to me, it often comes back to the agency question, which is that I see technology as being a kind of extension 
of our existing ontology. But you know, the, there is a bright line, I think, that is crossed when the machines become the, the agency producing nexus rather than just being part of our nexus. Mm -hmm. Because you can talk about transhumanism and plugging ourselves into machines, or even as um, uh, Andy Clark does, the, the extended mind, and you yeah. know, just thinking yeah. of, of there being this, this nexus of, of mm -hmm. cognition. But um, yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting. I mean, on, on that moral question, actually, aliens could come and land on the planet and they could be deciding whether or not to blow us up. And they've just read your book, The Mind mm. is Flat. And they were, um, you know, struck by the fact that we can only pay attention to one color at a time, one yeah. word at a time, that we're not really yeah. looking at them, you know, because yeah. we're just deluded by our confabulatory predictive models. And, you know, it, we're very, very similar to mini chat GPTs. And they might mm. just reasonably think, well, let's just blow them up. Yes, I think I'd be very harsh of them to do that, but <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think um, I mean they certainly would. I mean, an, an alien, uh, sort of super intelligent alien looking from space at our intuitive understanding of ourselves would say these people have got it completely wrong. I mean, yeah. I think one of the things that's quite interesting about psychology as a discipline is that when you start doing it. Um, there's a there's a part. It depends on which bit you're studying. So bits of it, you think, oh, this is kind of common sense. I mean, maybe common sense with evidence. So you know, common sense is you know, especially like everything else, very inconsistent, and some bits stand up better to, than others to analysis. And there are you know, there are nice, elegant uh, experiments and and theories which allow you to um, guide your common sense. But a lot of it sounds like common sense. Common sense plus. Um, mm. But on the other hand, um, when you start to look at the the machinery. The takes of, of, of the brain and look at the, the things we do with, with, without having a sense that they're uh, psychological at all. So things like seeing the world or understanding language or I mean, moving our bodies around. I mean, intuitive, intuitively, most of us don't, of course, in the in, in, in the world of machine learning and AI and so on, we, we don't see it this, this way. But intuitively, as everyday people, we don't think of these as psychological at all. We think, well, these, yeah. are, these are just these sort of happen. I mean, just my arms move about and my eyes just see. Um, so we don't, but, but of course, most of our most of our mental activity, the most of the brain activity, is actually dealing with all of this stuff. And when you think about that way that works, you realise, oh, hang on, uh, almost everything psychological is is, is that my, all my all my ideas about my own psychology are completely wrong. So rather than um, psychology playing back um, your intuitions at you and say, yeah, you're basically right, but here are a few adjustments. I think in, in, when you look more deeply, um, it's the psychology, our, our sense of our own psychology is almost 100% wrong. So as you say, I, mean, we, we, I look around the world, I think everything's in full detail and color. Um, if you say to me, oh, but hang on, your fovea is only very, very narrow. You've only got good vision in about one, you know, one degree of angle, and, and that's where most of your color vision is. I think, yeah, I kind of know that, but but on the other <laughs> hand, the world's full of color and full of and full of precise definition, and that, that's an illusion. Um, and 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 my sense that I have you know, a deep understanding of my own motivations. I'm not sure I do have that really, but if I if many people do, that, that's an illusion too. Um, you look at a page of text, as you were uh, suggesting. Um, I think I see all those words. Actually, if you blank them all out and put, make no X's except the word I'm looking at, pretty with a few letters either side, I won't notice anything different. Um, all these, you know, basically the world of sort of psychophysical and uh, psychological demonstrations is just absolutely stacked full of things that make you think, oh my goodness, my mind works totally differently from what I thought. Um, so, so I think the thing is that we've got this sort of rationalizing perspective on how, how our minds work. Um, and that's what some bits of the psychology textbook are telling you. They're saying, oh, yeah, well, you want to, you want to do that rationalizing. We'll help you rationalize better. But the other part of the book is saying, actually, all of rationalizing, it's rationalizing. It's not really how you work. Don't fool yourself. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and even in the language game, when, when you spoke about um, philosophers who really study concepts deeply, um, these are concepts that have still arbitrarily emerged from the language game. Yes, yes, but you know yes. there, there is this interesting kind of tendency to to think of objective reality as we experience it as being the real thing. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Um, I mean you know you, know, you, you were just talking about the, the the fovea, so we only see color you know just in our in our foveal cone, mm -hmm. and we hallucinate the color everywhere else. And then the temptation is to kind of think, well, you know, um, I guess we're talking about phenomenology and you could read your book and you could say, okay, so there is maybe only a tenuous relationship between our mm. percepts and our phenomenal experience of the world. Um, but a lot of philosophers really don't like that idea. I mean, wh mm. why is that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think there's a, there's a strand in philosophy 
Uh, and this may not go to the heart of the problem, but it, for me, it, it's my best shot. There's a strand in philosophy which is, starts from the point of view that, that common sense can't be far wrong. So you essentially say, look, the common sense view of the world is the thing we're trying to explicate. We're trying to clarify. It. And so, for example, if you talk about um, beliefs, um, you want to understand, well, what is a belief then? There must be such things. We talk about them. So let's try and establish you know, what they are and how we know we've got one. Um, similarly with desires. Similarly, when you talk about perceiving a, a color, you think, well, there must be um, there must be a blue to be perceiving. That's what I, that's the way we talk. So we're trying to to make sense of the way we talk, um, and assuming that that is a kind of ground truth. And 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 that from that perspective, uh, annoying um, sort of physicists and um, physiologists and psychologists coming along and say, "What well, do you know? If you look at how color vision works and how color actually works, it's all rather complicated and very different from what you imagine." That's that, that sort of um, common sense grounded sort of approach to philosophy. Wants to say, well, that's all very well, but it doesn't really doesn't really change anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there's a there's a kind of um, a, a desire to to hold on to the intuitive position, even though I think that's uh, not always defensible. Yeah, I I, uh, I spoke with Dennett about you know he's got some wonderful ideas about color perception, mm. and this is a great one of those things about you know whether color is a, an ontological thing you know whether whether it exists in the physical world yeah, or whether it's yeah. only like a mentalistic property and this kind of you know um intention you know i guess you would call yeah. that the physical stance wouldn't it but what, what, what's your take on that yeah so i think i would be skeptical of thinking of of colors as part of the fabric of the universe um essentially for the same reason i'd be skeptical about almost any commonsensical notion um i mean the whole history of science is a, is a history of common sense ideas that either break up um, completely or get modified to the point of looking you know, almost unrecognizable. So we have a sort of intuitive notions of temperature, say, um, and you might think, well, our temperature is part of reality. Well, I mean, people have gone about forever saying they're hot and they're cold. Uh, but then if you think about the trying to understand the difference between the, you know, the, the hot, the coldness of, of ice versus the coldness of I know, equally cold metal or there is other you know, equally cold air. Um, you know, some things feel a lot colder than others. So we'd be saying to ourselves, well, I do understand the concept of hot and cold. And hot and cold is definitely part of reality. And I can tell you this cold metal thing is a jolly lot colder than the cold you know, air, say, or cold water. But you'd be totally wrong, um, at least if you try to understand temperature from a modern physics point of view. Um, so as soon as you start to break up um, the uh, intuitive for, for stru stru way of seeing the world and make it rigorous, then you know, concepts like temperature just blow up because you haven't really properly distinguished you know, heat flows and you know, temperature as thermodynamics would, would talk about it and so on. They're just not, you know, they're not, they're, not, they're just different parts of the physical realm which get bundled together. Which, when that, and that bundling is going to be determining our, you know, sort of our, our sensory. Um, our, our century perception of temperature. So, you know, I, whether I feel hot or cold is going to be determined by all kinds of funny things. If you think about the wind chill factor in which weather forecasts are so keen on, um, how cold it feels. Well, of course, once upon a time, there was just the feeling of cold and hot. Um, now we realize there's an enormous plethora of factors determining how hot or cold we feel, only one of which is this actual temperature thing. Um, so, saying, well, I have this sense of a category that um, is sort of available to me perceptually or from a sensory point of view, that must map onto the world? Absolutely not. And I mean, colours are another extreme example of that, really. The forces that drive colour perception are you know, really complicated and they're very contextual. And so, yeah, I mean, I think um, I would be, um, I'd be with Dennis on this one, I think. Yeah, um, colour's a great example. I mean, and, and temperature as well, because I guess they're, they're actually very vague, complex concepts. But um, I, I've got a good friend, Walid Sabah, and uh, he's a rationalist, just like Chomsky, and um, a, a go-fi uh, mm. guy. So you know, yeah. so someone who's trying to use these, um, you know, psychology rationalizations to mm. build AI from first principles. And in a way, the the world of go-fi has shrunk because I think over time people are starting to sign on to the fact that it's very gnarly and it's very complex. Mm. But but Walid is one of the last hangers-on. And he's making a similar argument to what you do in the language game, which is that there's a kind of information hierarchy. So you, you speak about N learning and C learning. So, yeah, you know, like yeah. nature and culture and culture, of course, is very complex and fractionated and arbitrary. And um, I guess he might be speaking even one level above N learning, which is like the platonic realm. 
So he says there are certain templates, cognitive templates, mm. that would exist if the universe didn't exist. So transitivity is a great example, yeah. or the located in or contains mm. template. So, you know, um, I put a thing in the bucket, I put the bucket over there, the, the bucket is now located over there. So, yeah. you know, yeah. he's quite reasonable. I mean, Gary Marcus makes the same argument. Yes. He calls it reasoning. Quite reasonably arguing that this does not exist in current AI systems and possibly should be. But it does seem to be quite a small set of models that, um, because rationalism, of course, is reasoning in the um, domain of certainty. Yes, yes. Well, I think this point about certainty is really crucial. So um, there aren't many aspects of the world where we can really reason with certainty because of this sort of um, unkempt and gnarly nature that the, that the world has. Um, so in reality, sort of axiomatic approaches are only helpful in very small numbers of cases. And we have retrospectively managed to axiomatize a few things. So it is possible sort of to axiomatize thermodynamics. Um, and that, that happened quite recently. Um, so you have, you've, working away with people are working away with thermodynamics forever um yeah. even formally and mathematically and they still haven't got the axiomatization straight and that comes later and probability theory of course was only axiomatized at the beginning of the 20th century and, and you know in general you know, even the things which where the certainty is possible like mathematics even there the axiomatization usually comes sort of late um, think about calculus i mean just trying to understand you know newton and leibniz were sort of setting off doing differentiation and integration but they hadn't really got any axiomatic foundation for that and it took ages and took 19th century real analysis to figure out how on earth how do you make sense for this this stuff um so i think always the axiomatization for me always comes last um and anyway um, yeah, almost everything we're thinking about is never going to be axiomatizable. So um, now I don't, I don't deny, and I think it's, it's a very interesting thought that there may be certain abstract patterns of thinking, things about like uh, basically some patterns of logical inference, thoughts about the ge geometry and so on, um, which may be things that you know it's not impossible that those things are I important and may maybe they're even built into us. That's you know not 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 a crazy idea at all. Um, but I do think, yes, that's, that's going to be a, a small aspect of you know, the total cha chaotic complexity of the world, our understanding of the world around us. Yes, and, and final question on that. I mean, you know, there's, there's this strand of mathematical realism, um, mm. or there are folks who think that it's basically something we, we've invented. I mean, where, where do you place yourself on that? Ah, yes, I mean, that's, that is very difficult, because um, I want to take a line, I'm not quite sure what the philosophical... Um, sort of right label philosophical label is for this but i want to take a line in which one thinks of mathematics as a bit like one thinks about chess so you know, we could have had different rules for chess uh any number of different rules I and mean, it would play differently but given the rules we've got you're kind of you know these this is your know, mating for is kind of mating for or it isn't um so you yeah. don't have limitless choice it's once you've sort of pinned pinned down the the, the, the details, you've, you know, that once you've got a formal system, then what that formal system does is kind of pinned down. So it's, but it's not the case that one could, so for example, if we take um, numbers, um, one could say, well, um, yeah, well you know, what's, the, what's the right actualization for numbers? And the answer would be, well, there's no answer to that because um, once upon a time, people didn't even know about negative numbers or um, fractions or, um, or um, uh, the difference between real and, um, well, remember the idea of irrational numbers and the whole number that says the real line and all of this stuff. So continually, as, as, we, as people study uh, mathematics more, new things start to appear. I mean, complex numbers, after all, and, and on, it, on it goes. Um, yeah. So, you know, sort of thinking to oneself, um, oh, well, this kind of pre-existed before we came to it is a bit misleading. But on the other hand, it's not the case that we have sort of free power of creation at every step. I mean, once we've sort of set the rules of chess, once we've set the rules of you know, piano arithmetic or something, well, then you're locked in. But you could change the rules. You could do something different if you wanted. Yeah, I know. And um, I asked the same question to Thomas Parr um, on Wednesday because... Um, a lot of people argue that you know the free energy principle, for example, is is ontological. You know that 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 it mm. basically is a statement about how how the world works. Or even with the you know the Bayesian brain mm. hypothesis, you could ask the question: Well, is the brain actually doing a Bayesian update? Mm. And the response is usually: I don't know what you mean by is it real and does it matter? Because frankly, it, it kind of mm. doesn't. I think that yeah, I think. I mean, I take a slightly different view of that, I suppose, because I think it's certainly, if it's a good approximation, I mean, the kind of classic, um, I think it was the statistician box with this famous 
phrase which we all, all, talk, all hear all the time that you know, some models are you know, all models are wrong but some are yeah. useful and i think that's that's basically deeply right um, with the possible exception of you know, extreme uh, extremely basic physics everything else is clearly approximation um, and essentially wrong out of uh, out of some tiny little domain um, so i think saying is it useful the question really is is it theoretically useful to think of the brain from a Bayesian point of view. Having said that, there is still the question, if you looked inside the system, can you see something that looks like Bayesian calculation or not? And I think you know, people would differ about that. Um, the overall uh, sort of input-output behavior, that's one thing. Can you re reconstruct that from a Bayesian point of view? I think often the answer will be more or less yes, roughly, at least at a qualitative level, even if you can't actually see the the update calculations going on but on the other hand if it turned out that you know some kind of um you know sort of bayesian propagation was going on in the mind i i don't believe it is but i'd be delighted i think well, this is absolutely <laughs> marvelous discovery um however i think it's very unlikely because that requires that one has a model of the world uh, which one can update in a consistent way and that's the whole thing i think is wrong um i think we don't we only have models of teeny slivers of the world um so within oh. your tiny sliver Maybe there's something you know, Bayesian going on. I'm, I'm glad we so. explored that, actually, because I was trying to wrestle with the apparent contradiction of, of obviously, mm. like um, making the connectionist argument, but also talking about perception as, as inference. Yes. Because, yes. because you actually stopped short then of, of saying it's a kind of Bayesian inference. But, but you do think it's some kind of... Well, you know, the interesting thing is that it's the same argument before. Whether or not it's doing Bayesian inference, it's as if it is. Yes, that's right. Yes. I, mean, I, I'm, I am conflicted on this. I mean, I am a very great believer in the utility of the Bayesian approach. Um, and indeed, um, uh, Tom Griffiths and Josh Tenenbaum and I have a book with many co-authors coming out only in a, you know, a year or two uh, on Bayesian, um, called Reverse Engineering the Mind, which is going to be a sort of big sort of synopsis of Bayesian approaches to cognition. So and that's that coming be, out in a year? Well, we, we're, we're doing the copy editing at the moment. So maybe it's a, yeah, something like a year or 18 months. Can you so. send me an advanced copy? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah, a huge absolutely. fan of Josh, by ah, the way. His right, work okay. at, at MIT is... Um, okay, so... I, I think he's doing some of the most exciting frontier work in AI at the moment. Yeah, um, no, thinking back to not only Dream Coder, but I mean, in, in, in the sort of Bayesian world, yeah. he's, he's incredible. Yeah, no, no, Josh is absolutely fantastic. And Tom, Tom Griffiths is an amazing guy. So yeah. it's a great, and, and this is with many, many other co-authors on individual chapters, but it's going to be, yeah, I think it's going to be a really, wow. really nice, really nice book. Um, but as I say, I'm, I'm conflicted on these issues because on the one hand, I'm very, very uh, taken with uh, the Bayesian approach to understanding specific bits of the cognitive system. But I you extrapolate that up to thinking oh well really the brain is just doing a sort of bayesian model of reality and all the people in it i think that's that's hopeless at the best we're very locally bayesian and very approximately yeah it, it, it's I'm, I'm torn as well it's such a wonderful way to to think about it even then um, things like model selection you mm. know because because a lot of in, intelligence or even ab abduction is about selecting models yep. or intelligence about creating models and doing so efficiently is is how we understand the world it's how we communicate we yep. it, this improvisation process in the language game um is the mutual creation of models and sharing models mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And from a Bayesian perspective, I guess that is quite a nice framework to understand it. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, but it's as you say, it's um, it's it's difficult to to, to think of that as the sort of total model um, yes. because of the uh, the fact that it's sort of hopelessly computationally intractable. And anyway, we don't we clearly have a very partial understanding of the little bits of the world we encounter, whereas the world's complexity is it vastly exceeds our compass. So. It can't be the case that this is the the right way to to think about cognition at, at, at an aggregate level. But little pieces of the system, I think, um, look quite Bayesian. Yes, yes, I, I think it's um, it's unlikely that we are solving that intractable. No. I mean, it, it it seems mathematically or just yeah. you know yeah, statistically impossible. But perhaps um, there is some um, you know smaller version of the problem that we are solving which could be thought of in, in analogous terms. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 In, in a way, um, you seem like strange bedfellows because um, he's really close with, um, you know, intellectually some of the active inference people because um, he talks yes. a lot about yeah. like core knowledge, for example. Mm. And yeah. this, this yeah. like Elizabeth Spelke type, um, mm. uh, you know, core knowledge. And presumably that is not what you... No, I mean, I thought I'm deeply hostile to it, but I know that's not my not my starting point at all, no. No, I think that's right. We are uh, we have lots of things in common, but um, yeah, I think 
and I think I think the mind is flatter than he does. <laughs> I think, for example, he's very keen, and I must say, it's very charming, and interesting set of ideas. The kind of idea of the vision as an inverse graphics engine. Yes, um, that's yeah, that that's fine. If you but then because have it, real inverse graphics engines, you know, have a lot of physics built into them. So you have to assume a kind of quite idealized model of the physical world. Um, Anyway, yeah, I mean, we are yeah. we 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 are, we are very agreed on some things and very dis, 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 distant on others. And yeah, we do yeah. we do do other stuff together. We have a, you know, we have you know, we have um, one or two papers over the years. We've got one one of them coming out at the moment. So it's it, though we're coming from different places. We're um, yeah, yeah, there are some connections. Because in a way, Bayesianism in general is about solving lots of inverse problems. Yeah, and I guess that that's an, an, a cognitive interface for us to reason about problems. But you're you're almost kind of like um you know you're, you're you're just moving the complexity somewhere else yeah because yeah, at some yeah. point you still need to actually like you know solve this problem yeah yeah indeed i I already said this to you last time nick but um i was reading this book when i was jetting or cruising around the norwegian fjords and uh, it was a serene setting i had you know mountains all around me i was in the spa on the boat and um i was reading your book and taking uh, notes on every single page and I even had some stickers as well. So when it was particularly wow. interesting, I, I put a gold star on there. Um, but no, the, the reason why I love this book so much is it, it's one of the, you know, like every few years or so, you read a book that really changes how you think about things. And this is definitely one of those books. Great, thank you. Um, especially because after speaking with Chomsky, um, I was kind of stuck between two worlds. And I always had leanings towards this direction of thought. But I think your, your book really, really pushed me, um, you know, completely into that um, school of thought. So maybe we should just kind of start off um, talking about, um, you, you spoke about, was it Captain Cook and, and yes, Pesh? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, talking about, you know, how they, they use the game of charades to, um, you know, get some mutual understanding. Yes, yes. Yes, yeah, so so one of, and this is apparently quite a common f phenomenon in um, the, the days of uh, of Cook's voyages, that the, the, the voyages would just trundle along the coastline in some remote spot, and they'd put in, and on the assumption that some 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 native people would appear, and there'd be a bit of trade and interaction, um, and uh, they, 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 this, would be, this would be mutually beneficial. Um, but of course, they'd be doing this with no, no common language. So Cook does this on a particular occasion, and they talk about how um, the, uh, the, 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 the 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 people that are on the beach are w w wait on one side. Then Cook, Cook and team are waiting on the other side. Um, I, th I think the, what, the two of the 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 the, the, the People, I think this is Tierra del Fuego, so the people from the, probably the Hausch um, community in Tierra del Fuego are now pretty much extinct, I think, sadly, due to brutal, um, you know, brutal effects of colonialism. Um, so a couple of people come come out um, with with weapons and they throw down the weapons, and um, Cook's team think, okay, so they're obviously saying, you know, we don't want to fight you. We're we're throwing aside our weapons. Um, and this is, they've never, they have no common language, they've never interacted before. This is completely de novo contact. Um, but that's, that turns out to be dead right. So they, they do a bit more of this kind of, of dance. And before you know it, the, uh, the native people are on ship. They're uh, eating and drinking and ha hating most of what they eat, I think. Um, but then exchanging, exchanging goods for mutual benefit. So the ability to, to forge a communicative relationship where you can actually do practical, useful things and avoid disaster such as, 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 as conflict, which does, it, it does happen. And indeed, Cook himself was in fact killed in a, uh, a later incident, I think, in, 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 uh, uh, in, in, somewhere in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, but the, the stakes are really high. But it's possible for people to actually invent communicative signals which are mutually interpretable. And I think this is you know, incredibly interesting because I mean you don't see any any sign of this in any other species. I mean this is an amazing thing that that, that, that human beings can figure out if I go through this set of actions, this sort of charade-like acting pretense, someone else will look at that and think, now you're trying to communicate with me here, and the, the message you're trying to convey is this. Um, in fact, we have to have the same understanding. You're, you're, you're sending a signal out into the world and saying. What do we think? What do we think this means? I have the sticks. I throw the sticks down. What's the blood about? And I have to think as I, if I'm doing that that action. I have to think. Well, I think it means this, and I have to think you're you're going to think the same things. So we've got to converge on the same mutual understanding, uh, even though we have no, um, you know, no, 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 very little common cultural background and no language. Um, 
and this is something that we you know, it's, a, it's an amazing feat uh, and i think it's something that's uniquely human uh, but i think that's the uniquely human that that pragmatic communicative drive and ability that's the thing that really makes humans um distinctive perhaps unique but i mean whether it's a precise whether it's a, a categorical distinction or a gradation it makes us very special and that's the thing that's going to drive the ability to create communicative systems so the point of the language game is saying start with that kind of example or think about playing charades um, as a parlor game where you're not allowed to speak you just do funny actions to indicate you know uh, godzilla or king kong whatever you're trying to do um, then you realize that you create these momentary uh, signals which mean something also you can reuse them so once you've done for example the stick throwing aside you can you can do that again to mean something you know something similar if i've done a chest beating for king kong i might think well now i want to do uh, you know, a chimpanzee well i'll try chest beating that seemed to work pretty well before and i'm going to somehow you know I don't know, do a gesture for smallness to say, oh, it's not King Kong anymore, it's now it's a chimpanzee or, <laughs> or whatever. But, but we'll, we'll, then we'll create these um, simple actions which will start to have more, more and more specific meanings. And we can chain them together, like you know, King Kong but smaller. Oh, but smaller could be a kind of you know, changing the, you make, going from a well part, parted hands to, you know, to, 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 to parted fingers, say. And that might then become a generic way of making things smaller, whatever they ha happen to be. So you can quickly, quickly generate something which is a little bit language-like in the sense it has a set of standardized conventions and they become sequenced and so on. And, and those conventions will become um, quicker and quicker and more crude. So you don't go to the whole sort of um, full King Kong um, sort of pantomime. You just do a few clues and we think, oh yeah, I know what that is. So the, the, the signal becomes stylized, it becomes sequenced and so on and so on. Um, and the thought is that this is, this is really what's underlying the, the foundations of, of human communicative systems. So we know... Um, through the, the, the amazing observation in, in Nicaraguan orphanages for, for deaf children in uh, the 70s and 80s, um, that you can get the spontaneous creation among groups of people, children who have no other means of communication. They start to spontaneously create um, sign language, sign systems, which turn pretty quickly into full blown sign languages as complicated as any um, prior, prior sign language, or nearly, or, or any other human language at all. I mean, these are, these are just as complex. Um, as, as languages and they're created in a few generations of kids over a you know, decade or two um, through spontaneous interaction so that's I mean if you're for, for some people some, for someone with a more nativist perspective that uh, that the, the message of that story is ah language is pretty much built in it just needs to be triggered look it's just emerging spontaneously um, for my friend and um, collaborator Morton Christensen and I we'd say no that's the, completely the wrong story the right story is um we're amazingly good at creating communicative conventions in the moment. We're good at reusing them and give us a bit of a, ch a chance and we'll create you a system. These things, these systems sort of, sp sort of spontaneously arise um, through reuse and, and repurposing. Um, and of course, when you think from that point of view, um, it changes everything really. So the first thing it changes is uh, one's answer to the question, oh, why are languages so well adapted to us? Um, you know, what, why is it that we find them so e easy to learn in the sense that you know, every child um, exposed to any language can learn it quite quickly? And then the answer is going to be, oh yeah, of course, because we, we just we created them, didn't we? They're the things that are natural ways of, for us to communicate because that we, we created them over a, you know, over a period of incremental chevard playing. So the things that seem natural to us and the categories that seem natural to us and the ways of you know, doing syntax that seem natural to us, those, those are the ones that languages embody because the languages have evolved to be culturally oh, through cultural evolution to be natural um, and if you ask yourself you know why is it that, la that languages have um, uh, similar structures to each other which is a fairly arguable question actually because they're, they're much more diverse than i mean not, i'm no expert but the people who look at the full panoply of the six or seven thousand human languages on the planet would say my goodness they are pretty diverse but it, to the extent that there are commonalities then the answer would be, well, that's going to be in the same way that charade playing is going to have commonalities. There's going to be, you know, at the beginning, there might be bits of iconicity. You know, you're trying to do King Kong, you do a King Kong-like action. Yeah, that, that, that fades away and becomes rather marginal pretty quickly in most languages. Um, and But you're going to have compositionality. You're going to have to create complex messages from simple components. Well, that's, you know, that's something that's going to be sort of wired into the basic system. We're probably going to have to have a small number of meaningful units. 
Um, we can't have a, a, an inventory of meaningful units, which is only you know, as, as tiny as five or six, because there's, there's more things in the world we want to talk about. But if we make it too big, we can't learn them all and blah, blah, blah. So the, you know, there's going to be the same communicative pressures, the same challenges that we're facing when creating these these cultural forms so they're going to have some common properties so that you don't have to explain those common properties by by focusing on the um the properties of the brain you're more thinking uh, of course brains do have properties that are relevant but the languages basically the the, the languages are uh, adapting to us rather than there being a, a surprising um degree to which the the brain is kind of built to do language yes yeah i mean i, I guess we'll get on to the um the kind of the mimetic properties of, of language in, in a bit but but also um as well as having the same brain we we, we share the same physical yes. environment yes. we have this the same physical in embodiedness um you know which would presumably create a certain guardrails in in how this language game could be played but just to go back a tiny bit so the interesting thing about humans is that because of our evolutionary history we don't necessarily need to have language. So you, you can raise um, humans without language, but they will be very, very different to humans with language. And you were talking about, you know, so we, we do this incredible mental gymnastics. We play the language game, you know, with ingenuity and, and inventivity and, and, and we create language. And then there's a kind of um, maturity curve. So it starts off as pigeon and then it becomes creole, and then over time, we see this conventionalization and, and, and we see that, you know, sort of concepts becoming formed and further embedded and shared, especially if they have value. So, I mean, could you could you talk to that evolution a little bit? Yes. Um, so so just to say a little bit about the, the pigeon Creole story. So when um, groups of people have contact where they have no common language, this would be like the, the house and, and cook. Um, when that happens for an extended period of time, uh, pretty quickly some convention system of conventions emerges. So although it's true that people can live without language and there are these horrendous cases where children are raised with in very bizarre circumstances where their caregivers, inverted commas, are not actually speaking to them at all and they don't don't learn language because they're not, expo not exposed to one. And that has pretty, pretty cataclysmic um, social and cognitive consequences. Um, but it's... Yeah, that's incredibly unusual. You put two people together, they start communicating as best they can. And um, so when you have people with, 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 with different languages, they will start to create a system uh, which has very, very simple syntax, which at least will allow them to talk about specific objects that they need to you know, move around or trade or whatever. Um, but as, as the children of people who speak, who have learned this pidgin, um, which is, is the name for uh, this, this kind of very simplified language for working across the divide, the, the children of those people will take that pidgin and elaborate it and turn it into something which is essentially its own language. So you know, there, there will be a, you know, there will be structures and patterns in that language which didn't exist and that the, the pigeon, pigeon speakers won't really understand. And you know, you, before you know it, you've essentially got a full-blown language and your Creoles mm -hmm. are full-blown languages. So you end up with something which is a little mixture of, uh, of of the two two base languages, or maybe sometimes more than more than two. So the tendency to create rich s systems is is very basic to us. You, you give people a chance to communicate; they'll they're driven not by the desire to create a language. No one's ever bothered to. No one's interested in doing this unless you're um, in, 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 unless you're sort of inventing Esperanto or you're you know Tolkien trying to create an Elvish language or something. I mean, most of the time. People aren't interested in creating languages. They just want to communicate, but they want to get their message across to another person. They've got to do it somehow, and they'll try and use some signals using based on signals they've already got to hand, and the person will respond in kind. And that process of incremental struggle to just to get our messages across and get to work successfully together that will drive us to create um, you know, create a system to a piece by piece. Uh, so it's so it's a very I think it's a very interesting phenomenon that um, this is it goes back to Adam Ferguson, the Scottish um, Enlightenment uh, philosopher of the 18th century, has this wonderful phrase that um, that many aspects of society are created um, by human action, not of human design. And I think that the deep insight in that is that um, most of the time when we're creating almost any aspect of culture, it's not that we're blindly just randomly sort of um, thrashing. Um, we're, we're trying to solve a particular, we're acting in a, in a purposeful way, trying to solve a particular problem, trying to make a communication, trying to build a, uh, a house that stands up or trying to solve some problem. But by trying to do solve the problem in front of us, we're incrementally creating new tools and new methods that can be used in you know, unexpected ways. So we're 
sort of contributing rather like a termite, uh, contributing to the the creation of its its mound, uh, but contributing to this 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 collective construction of which we no particular interest. We're not we don't care about that. We just want to solve the problem in front of us. But but nonetheless, we are creating this this collective. Um, collectively, we're creating something that should be complicated. And human languages are they are, you know, they are one of our most perhaps our most astonishing achievement as a species, really. Yeah, and I'm fascinated by this idea of collective intelligence. Um, so the extreme view is that we are just like ants. That we discussed this last mm. time. Um, but that can't be true because we are capable of solving yeah. problems and planning and, and doing some form of sophisticated cognition. So so then there's this notion of, okay, so I, I learn how to use a tool and then I share that simulation with others and it, and it becomes mimetically embedded in, in our culture. And then... The interesting thing, though, is, is it becomes a form of collective intelligence because other people in the uh, in the environment, they might learn to use the tool differently or they might improve on it. And then that will be yeah. propagated back to me. And the fascinating kind of progression from my point of view is, is when almost the locus of intelligence becomes more um, kind of focused on the um, the meme sphere than, than the individual agents. Like when does that mm. transition happen? Yeah, I, mean, I think I think it. It does happen quite early, actually, uh, in, in in human development. So, um, I mean, if every if if we all had to solve all our sort of cultural um, and technological problems from scratch, we'd we'd be struggling. Yeah. Um, so, I know Mike, Michael Tomasello is always keen on pointing out the the um, uh, de developmental psychologists and primatologists. He's always point, keen on pointing out the the thing about humans is that. Um, we're always improving on past solutions by other people, and if we weren't, um, and, and often blindly, I mean, we, mo we we can't be thinking. I want to validate and fully understand why this is the right solution. Think through all the alternatives. You know, don't take nothing for granted. That would be a mad approach, um, because we'd all be trying to understand the world you know, from from scratch, and human progress would be impossible. Uh, whereas in practice. We largely take everything around us on faith. We think, oh, well, we, this is, seems to be how we hunt and this is how we make a boat. And um, I guess I'll, I'll go with that. And you might make an incremental change or improvement. But largely, you're taking the, 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 the way of life of the people around you and the way, the way it works, including your systems of communication, including language. You're taking them for granted and working with them and, 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 and accreting um, small variations uh, and perhaps improvements. Um, and, but, but because you're doing that, um, you, it's not really right to think that the the location of uh, sort of cultural and intellectual progress is in any particular head. I and mean, we have this sort of great person theory of of uh, of progress as we do uh, in, when thinking about history generally. So we tend to think, well, it's these particular individuals that have brilliant insights. And of course, there are undoubtedly particular individuals with brilliant insights. No doubt that's true. But really, um, I mean, if you took Einstein out of the uh, 19th century uh, physics background, where's he going to be? Nowhere, right? He's got no chance of making spectacular um, uh, b breakthroughs in 1905 if he's got hasn't got this enormous intellectual milieu of people probably less smart than Einstein, most, most of us are, to put it mildly. But, um, but you know, these people have created this enormous infrastructure of mathematics and, and, and experimentation and physical understanding in which, and indeed philosophy, in which it's, and language and all of this stuff, so Einstein can make an incremental contribution. It's a, it's, it's a small step. Of course, it turns out to be a spectacularly productive step. Um, but the productive, it, 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 it's, it's productive um, because there are all these other people around and all the other infrastructure around so that, that the further incremental changes can be built on top of, the, of that individual. So I think, you know, in a way, we, should, we really should be thinking of human progress much more than we do, and I don't quite know how to think about this correctly, but we should be thinking of human progress, um, and of course it's not always forwards, um, as, as a kind of collective computation. So we should think about the computational system as not, it's not the only computation, the, the brain isn't the only computational system in town. Probably the more interesting one is the, you know, the collective computations that we're doing. Think about, thinking about this, as, say, as a scientific or a mathematical community or in inventing new technologies or... Um, the creation of artistic forms. These are things that are really a collective computation. And we don't really have a good way to understand that. But we do know that um, you know, parallel computation with large numbers of, of agents is, you know, is, is, is you often a very powerful thing. Um, and I think yeah, that we should be trying to understand ourselves as small components in a big parallel computation a lot of the time. Yeah, I've been reading a book about creativity and it's um, it's something that wasn't even a concept that we spoke about or could conceive of 
Uh, and then we mm-hmm. you speak about that in the language game that many concepts even things like money for example are just cultural inventions mm. but um yeah and we started studying it i think only in the 20th century and through the ages it was thought of first of all as um you know like when in, when when we had the greek gods it was not seen as possible for anyone to be creative and if it was it was mm. something expressed through through god and yep. um, and then we've yep. gone into the sort of Renaissance period, and and then we did have you know folks like Leonardo da Vinci, and 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 they they were deified as being mm. very creative, and in more recent centuries we're moving towards this kind of we concept of of creativity that we see it as a social thing, and you were just describing like Einstein, and there's this information graph, and you know perhaps a creative act is some um, you know big gradient on that graph where we introduce Mm. something of novelty and value and then there's a social proof component as well which is to say that it needs to be recognized by other people but creativity is one of these concepts just like we were talking about earlier with things like intelligence that you can describe it in many many ways and you never seem to capture the whole phenomenon yeah yeah i think that's right and it probably isn't a a well-defined thing really Um, another example i really like is the will which i think in the sort of um, uh, early philosophy of mind going back I suppose to the 18th, 18th century was hugely important everyone was going on about the will and everything's driven by the will and trying to understand the will was really crucial and we've all sort of forgotten about it now uh, we occasionally talk about willpower and so on but we just mm. don't go about thinking what really explained the will um, and similarly it's very interesting and I hadn't, wasn't really aware of it that the idea that creativity is seems in retrospect quite natural to think well why would we yes why why would we think of that as a as a as a as a, as a category rather than just people doing things well or badly mm. just you know, doing paintings doing bits of you know um uh, anatomy um why do we suddenly say oh hang, hang on this is this is a creative activity we're in here and this is a particularly large creative moment um that's you know so it's very it's a very particular way of thinking and speaking we shouldn't um Yes, we shouldn't shouldn't take that as take that for granted. That's a, a game we've yes, a game we've just invented. Yeah, because right. it's quite quite a, a Western thing as well to think in this way. And I, I suppose the irony is that your book is telling the story of everyday moments are extremely creative. Yes. And in yes. fact, um, there is a drive to, um, to to do this language game even gratuitously. So you know, I'm, I'm traveling with my girlfriend and. We are just creating words for things, you know, like it, it's not a glacier, it's an Enrique Iglesias, and then it's an yep. Enrique, and it's just a yep. private yep. language, yep. and there, there's, it's rapport building, there's, there seems yep. to be a very natural drive to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely, no, we, 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 I think to the extent that one should think about creativity as a useful concept at all, we should absolutely be thinking of ourselves as in daily life, unbelievably creative. Yes, it's completely wrong, I think, to be to, to be thinking uh, that there are some creative people and other creative people or the creative people are being creative when they're doing their special creative thing. We're all being amazingly creative all the time. Um, and ju- just understanding things like these simple charades, um, doing charades, is, is, is an astonishing, astonishing feat from a sort of computational point of view. I mean, there's so many possible actions you could carry out um, you have to think well what knowledge do i have what does the knowledge that the other person have which means that if i do these actions they're going to draw this inference it's like really a really hard thing to do and yet we do it you know with absolutely you know with no effort at all without thinking anything about it and you know some people are better at these things these particular things than others but it's either it's create creativity you know, through and through or pictionary is another one either people can think oh i can't really draw i'm absolutely hopeless but they will still manage to convey you know, a movie title or a book or something through some sort of bizarre drawing and that is an astonishingly creative thing to do in fact in some ways the more hopeless your drawing the more creative it is because you're forced to rather than try to produce a you know, a, 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 a convincing likeness of Mel Gibson or something you have to do something much more indirect but we can do that um, and it's, it, it's an incredible um, yeah it's an incredible feat but the, and the other thing about this process that's worth stressing is it's incredibly um, ad hoc and momentary so the thing about this viewing language as a sort of charade like process is that we only have to solve the problem for the moment we're in so with your 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 fun names for for glaciers um that only has to work um in the context of you and your girlfriend and this particular place and if you were to come across some other icy formation perhaps in antarctica and to think oh, does, is this a glacier or not? I'm not really sure. It's, there's a lot of ice, but is there a mountain behind it? I, and what exactly is the definition? It doesn't matter. It yeah. doesn't matter. At the point you're having the interaction, um, 
you have a clear sense, a clear enough sense that, that that's one of those glacier things and that's another one. Um, and we might ask all kinds of abstract questions about what you know, what, what would be one of these, you know, could you have such a thing on Mars, for example, or uh, would it be a glacier if it was made of something other than water? It's just irrelevant. Now, it's because it becomes relevant if you start to think of this as a scientific project of universal application. But the thing about um, communication is it never is. Mm. It's about getting our message across right now, it's saying, look at that fun thing. Oh, it's moving, or oh, it's retreating, or you know, you're just trying to convey a specific, um, specific message in a particular moment. And the the ability to talk generally about the world is is that's the thing that comes last. So it's the language is specific, specific first and general later. And I think that's a, just a gigantically it's sort of gigantic, in some ways it's very obvious, but it's, it's possible to make a gigantic mistake by thinking no, the right starting point for thinking about language is to think of it as sort of like a formal logical language which makes universal statements about reality. Because then as soon as you mention glaciers, you think, oh, well, 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 what is the set of all glaciers in the universe? And that must, that must be well defined, otherwise what are we talking about? And then you're immediately into you know, sort of rabbit holes of uh, which you need in practice be even contemplating. You're, you're solving the problem right in front of you. Yes, and so this bottom-up approach is, is quite interesting. So you're talking about the moving from the specific to the general. And I think that is how a lot of our cognition works, even though like a lot of, yep. um, you know, psychologists might argue otherwise. And you give this beautiful example, you call it the lightness of meaning. Yes, and yes. Because this is one thing I wanted to get to, which is that when we play the language game, uh, we're physically situated in the same space. This is very high resolution. I, I can point mm. to any yep. objects, like, you know, we can do multimodal gestures, sounds, yep. And, yep. and so on. And of course, we do all the time without, again, in this very creative way, without thinking anything about it. We, we gesture and nod and, you know, do shrugs and all of these things without without batting an eyelid it, it, exactly so so the, so the language game starts off high resolution and then there's this kind of cone where things become overloaded compressed uh, conventionalized there's you know the euphemization of language is, a, is is another one and and part of that is because of the carrying capacity you know so so it's quite a, it's quite efficient for words to be transmitted because we can't really you know transmit a pointer no. to a flower anymore um so how how does how does that process work and maybe speak to the overloading of, of lightness i think is a great example yes yes so i think the, the so um i think the starting point we often have when we think about words is that we think well every word must have a meaning and okay there are ambiguous words but let's put them to one side if they're just that's like other words but they just happen happen to have several several meanings just crowding onto the same word so it's a bit like sort of thinking of the river banks and, and financial banks Yes, but basically one word, one meaning. But when we think about it a bit more, and this has kind of been very much explored um, in the later, later part of the 20th century, especially since Wittgenstein's um, analysis of language games. So Wittgenstein obviously used the term language game in a slightly different way to us, but you know, he's clearly a, a major inspiration for what we've been thinking about, um, as he has been, of course, for many, many people thinking about language for the past uh, sort of 60 or 70 years. Um, so Wittgenstein would have said, well, hang on, look, look closely at the, the way words are used. And you'll notice that there are all kinds of usages which are, are not actually particularly distinct, but they're not quite the same either. So if you take something like, um, so he used the term family resemblance for them, so that the you know, different usages can resemble each other in a variety of ways, and there's maybe no common feature. Um, so if you take something like light, um, you can talk about um, light uh, objects. So you think, oh, that's that's pretty much what light means. It's about weight. But then you can talk about light cavalry, and you think, oh, well, I suppose that's sort of cavalry with not very heavy stuff on uh, light music ah uh, now we're getting into trouble so what, what, what is this it's um or indeed heavy music is a bit strange but um it's entirely you know entirely uh entirely comprehensible um and we can have we can think about um uh light opera or a, or a light um uh, a light cruiser or a, you know, a light almost anything and when we think about these different meanings they're, they're not unrelated it's not it's not that they're um completely disconnected um but they are it's not, it's not completely clear what the, what the connection is so talk about a light blue it somehow would be weird if a light blue was extremely extremely dark it seems sensible that a, if a light thing is something feather like then a light blue ought to be sort of pale um and this is because of you know the way you know different modes um different perceptual modes so we interact it seems natural to think of um you know, uh, pale things as connected to sort of delicate things. In, but this is all coming out of our you know, sort of perceptual systems. Um, and those connections make sense when you think we're doing something charade-like. So if I want to talk to you 
about um, a light blue or a um, a light load or whatever it may be, if you realize that I'm playing charades the whole time and I'm thinking, well, I haven't got a word handy for that pale blue. Oh, well, it's sort of, you know, sort of ethereal and sort of weightless. Ah, light. I'll call it light. And off I go and call it light blue. And you think, I see what you mean. Yes, I guess. Um, and then before we know it, we've established this. Now, of course, this is actually established in the language. But this hasn't come from nowhere. It's come from a sort of analogical kind of extrapolation of a charade-like type. And that's going to be true you know, wherever you look. The number, of, the number of ways light is used is gigantic. But they have this common sort of analogical pattern. So they're emerging from this, from our perspective, they're emerging from this sort of charade-like um, improvisation where the same conceptual tools are being continually reused and reused and reused. So it's not one word, one meaning. It's one word, many, many possible meanings. Put words together in different contexts, they will mean completely different things. That's okay because we can track this because we are, you know, these words are, um, their flexibility is, tr is, is being shaped by what our natural communicative instinct so we don't have to think well light blue i'm starting totally from scratch here that could be absolutely anything it could be blue mixed with lots of red or it could be um very very deep or no it's not really true it's sort of the the natural analogy that for some reason we have is you know feathery ethereal things pale things kind of go together okay for whatever reason that's the way we are um so that's yeah. the natural a natural transition to make so th this is really interesting because we're getting into analogical reasoning and you could look at all of the usages of light and that that is a beautiful example saying so you, you know go in the dictionary and look at you know a light curry might be a, yeah. another example yeah. yeah and you might look at those and and think well they're really divergent um it seems arbitrary and it might be even more so if the language evolution has progressed and and the the kind of the cognitive distance has has progressed yeah. and, and so on but weirdly in many cases we can look at them and, and we can see the analogy between them and it's it's difficult to understand why that is it might be because we're like a neural network and and because we we've seen it used in all of those cases that's the only reason for the analogical mm. link it might be because they were conceived in a shared physical and cognitive space yeah. which means even though it seemed quite random at the time there was some grounding because with creativity, there, there seems to be like a degree of randomness, a degree of grounding, a degree of interestingness, maybe some kind of intuition. It's mm. very mysterious, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you're right that these are when you think about the the um, the origin of the vocabulary we speak with now. Um, it's it, I, I think you, for our for, for Morton and I, we'd like to think think of that as a as a as the outcome of a long a long game of charades. But of course, as you say, that in the latter stages of that game, we may well have completely forgotten quite why what was the analogy between X and Y. Well, who knows? We've we've forgotten that. But now it's become established. Off we go. So we might be using um, the same the same a, a term in ways which you know, where we've completely forgotten the connection. Um, so the the history is always going to be sort of difficult to to disentangle. But but I think the, the crucial point is to try and put aside the idea that, oh, but there must be some common core. There must be some real meaning. What's light deep down? I think that's almost invariably an error. It's a bit like going back to your point about you know, creativity and uh, thinking, thinking um, well, you know, what, you know, what, what, what's creativity? What, what's, the, what's the underlying real thing? Um, the fact that we can talk fluidly uh, about a concept, light or um, creativity or anything else uh, in a huge variety of con co um, contexts is telling you something about the clever analytical ability of the mind. So, for example, I mean, a creative um, idea in mathematics versus a, uh, a, a creative recipe versus a, uh, a creative charade. I mean, it's, it's really very hard to understand what, it, what is the, the, the connection between these. But there's some sort of analogical thing. It's like, oh, that's when you think about it, you think, well, that wasn't obvious, but it seemed really cool or something. But all you need is that crude, crude analogy because all you're trying to do is communicate in the moment. You're, um, you're just trying to say, oh, that idea seems like a really boring idea, but this is you know, a bit more you know, productive or, you know, or maybe we'll call it creative. Um, you're only trying to, 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 so to solve the problem in the moment, which would, would be to say, steer away from this boring thing and steer towards this more exciting thing or whatever it may be. So thinking of, thinking of the purpose of language as always contextual and always just trying to coordinate our interactions in, in the moment they're happening uh, that makes it puts a lot less load on the 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 idea of, of of meaning and it doesn't it sort of abstracts or pushes one away from thinking there must be some abstract core there must be a, a an underlying meaning 
I mean, the whole search for the underlying essences is a is almost invariably doomed to fail. I think. Yes, I know, but but um, many do um, try to essentialize language, and they would be forgiven for thinking that there is an essence because there is an apparent consistency. Yes. yes. And. But but if you think about it, we could contrive uh, mutations to the language where there was no analogical link. It, it's it, but it is mm. surprising though just how consistent it is, given how yeah. arbitrary it was. Yeah, yeah, and I think if if, if languages um, were not deeply patterned and analogically, uh, even though there will be some of that patterning will be lost um, in, in the midst of time. If they weren't deeply patterned, we wouldn't be able to learn them. Um, so that's the, the mm. thing. All the, all the cases which just don't really fit the pattern, they're going to go. We're going we're gonna to lose them because we don't quite remember why they work the way they should. And um, So they'll be, they'll be the things that get that dropped pretty quickly. Uh, yes. Because I think another reason we think this way is in school we're taught, um, you know, about grammar, for example, and uh, my mother used to say, uh, Timothy, we'll speak the Queen's English in this house. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when, when text message uh, abbreviations came along, there's a chorus of people, you know, just talking about the decline of, of our yes, language. Yes. And yes. Um, apparently that happens almost every generation. Yes, yes, it's lovely. There's just this incredibly long history going back to, I think, Roman times and certainly through the history of the, the English language, of a continual sense of despair that the language is falling into total <laughs> ruin. <laughs> and, and of course, it, it does go back to this kind of failure to to really believe in the improvisational power of human communication. Because if you if you change people's constraints, so you force them to type awkwardly on a, on a keypad uh, on their phone, um, then they will they will improvise differently. They'll start to use little symbols. They'll start using emojis. They'll they'll use all kinds of shortenings they didn't use before. But if you take those constraints away, they're not. Um, it's not that they've got this fixed structure they're now stuck with, and all they can do is sort of do emojis, send emojis to each other. Um, they will simply jump back to using the full repertoire of um, communicative possibilities. So there's always this sense that the language is going to the dogs, um, but it but it never thankfully does. And of course, the other aspect of it is that um, when languages change. There's this, always this terrible fear that distinctions that were really very important are getting lost. And how will we ever be able to communicate about this, you know, this particular idea or concept or this distinction which is being blurred? And the answer is, we'll invent a new one. If it matters, mm. there will be a new distinction before you know it. So you know, one needn't worry. Um, the, 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 the human ability to, to creatively solve communicative problems that need to be solved is not... Um, it's not going to get, go away. And the, the fact that we have distinctions that we think are important is, 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 is telling us that there's a drive to make those distinctions in certain circumstances. So they're going to get, they're going to get made. And the languages are, are, around the world are all very different. They all allow us to communicate about just everything we want to communicate about. And they're flexible. We can add new words as you do uh, as, as you do in sort of casual conversation with your girlfriend, you add, you, you make up new words and play with language and you make distinctions that haven't been made before. We all do that. And that's um, you know, that, that that capacity, the open-ended nature of language, is, you know, is 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 our salvation, really. And I think that should make make us much less worried about the idea that um, that language is this kind of fixed system, continually in danger of erosion. Which, uh, and, you know, as, as a, rather like this, the Greeks had the sense that um, their own civilization was was a sort of a, a, a collapse from the, the golden age, and the um, that that, that um, you know, sort of uh, uh, human progress was already sliding disastrously. Um, and I think that's just a natural, a natural, a natural tendency. And I think we should, uh, yeah, fight against it. We should have a more optimistic perspective. We are actually astoundingly creative uh, creatures, and we'll um, find our way to, to to communicate and think intelligently about almost anything, given half a chance. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is because we feel that it's the personification of an objective reality, and it's converged, and and any deviation is a kind of derangement of yes. that. Yes. But of course, that's just not the case at all. But it's interesting, though, that, that you're, you're using the word, you know, um, communication expedient. And there is an interesting juxtaposition with communication and thinking, because I, I, I think you're communicating a model, and a model is knowledge, and the, the process of language evolution is epistemic foraging. So it's, it's the mm. search for new knowledge, and knowledge which becomes mimetically ensconced um, is knowledge that works because it has intrinsic value by other people. I mean, we could argue whether it has intrinsic value or it just has mimetic value because everyone's using it. But o over time, we are, you know, the, the, the knowledge is being shaped 
we're taking parts of the models away that we don't need anymore and we're adding in new models when we do need them but some of that knowledge is grounded to objective reality but probably the, the bulk of it as you argue in the book is is really quite relativistic yeah i think um the degree to which languages are shaped around the physical world is is pretty loose um I mean, again, the the thing that we're mostly worried about in, in in communicating successfully is is really local stuff. So it's not that if you take, look, for example, at the tax, the, the biological taxonomies that different languages have, it's not the case that they all just map on neatly onto either each other or a, what sort of modern biology would tell us. If you looked at, as it were, the the uh, evolutionary history, we're not reconstructing that, and um, we're solving pr practical problems like these are edible things, these are not edible things, these are things that need to be cooked, these are things that don't need to be cooked, these are things you can, that run about and have to be chased, and these are things that sit on the lie are on trees and just can be foraged. The, it's um, you know, these are the you know, the things that um, the, the the practical challenges we face are going to shape the way we we, we use words, and those will be flexible from one culture to the next, but but also from one situation to the next. Um, and as ever, we shouldn't be thinking uh, ask, thinking we should ask the question, and for this language, you know, what are its concepts? You know, what are the key concepts in this language? That's a mistake because the, the, um, the, the, the as we were talking about with light, there's no answer to the question, you know, what does light mean or what does uh, creativity mean or what does anything mean in the abstract? There's simply this sort of network of particular um in particular examples of how this can be used effectively. So yeah, in page 101, uh, you said that Noam Chomsky's entry into the study of language in the mid-1950s sparked a revolution, both in terms of ideas and, you know, more literally as, a, as an academic coup de tat. Um, the young Chomsky was an iconoclast and a brilliant scholar, you say, deeply immersed in philosophy and logic and what would now be called theoretical computer science. And he had a radically new agenda aiming to wrestle linguistics from the study of culture, which is what we've been talking about, and yeah. reconstruct it on abstract mathematical and scientific foundations. So, I mean, what, what's your take on Chomsky? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's no doubt that the, the Chomsky revolution in linguistics is an astonishing achievement. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing to take the the, the, the intellectual ideas that have been developed for understanding formal languages um, in, in logic and what became the foundation of computer science and to realize that that could be used as a basis for understanding grammar. So it's an amazing um, and, and, and amazing insight. But I think the breaking away, breaking language away from um, culture was a, is a kind of fundamental mistake from from. Morton, in my perspective. So we want to see we, we want to see the, the see the kind of chaotic and um, ill-disciplined nature of language as inevitable, and the patterns that arise within it are coming about by periods of entrenched usages and repeated analogies and so on. So we want to see the order in languages coming up, uh, coming about spontaneously through processes of cultural evolution. Um, so it's going to always be inherently um, messy and inconsistent, and it's not not going to be governed by um, general principles that the the, the um, relationships and patterns within it are going to be ad hoc, um, arising bottom up, and therefore conflicting, like any other bottom up principles of order. Different principles will be governing different parts of the language, and they will clash, and there will be dissonances between them. Now, if we're coming from Chomsky's perspective, you don't want to see language as a cultural product at all. Uh, you want to see it as essentially an abstract mathematical object, and then the messiness and awkwardness of language gets shuff shuffled off to be either performance or just to be in the, the periphery of the language. So you say there's this kind of, there's this core essence, the essential part of the language, which in fact, for Chomsky, he wants to view that as, as, as the, that essence as the same for all languages, aside from sort of parametric variations. Um, and and But for, for us, we want to see the um, the patterns in languages as, 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 the, as, as secondary. So rather than saying there's this kind of core um, and then it kind of, um, for some mysterious reason, is varied and sort of messed up by you know, actual linguistic use and the evolution of actual languages. Um, but the core is kind of solid. We would like to say the the, the patterns and, and commonalities and, and sort of regularities in language are the things that are emerging um, over time. So then you pl start playing charades without any of these, but after a bit of charade playing, suddenly patterns start to emerge. So, of course, that from that perspective, you don't want to have, you shouldn't be looking for um a kind of mathematical abstraction, which is going to perfectly capture language. It's just a mistake to think that's such a thing. Um, 
And, and, and the only way you can maintain that viewpoint is by an awful lot of violent um, cajoling of language to fit the pattern. Um, so my feeling would be that um, it's much better to, to see language as a soft, flexible, culturally uh, created and ever, ever mutating uh, construction rather than having a, a fixed mathematical basis. So I think the Chomsky the insight is, a, is, a, is a, the, the program is a fascinating one, but I think ultimately it hasn't proved to be the right tack. Yeah, I mean, as, as a computer scientist, I can really understand where he's coming from. And, you know, he, he developed this um, formal language hierarchy. Yeah, I mean, it, it, he, he was thinking about, um, you know, Turing machines, for example, as being able to recognize recursively innumerable um, languages. And it, it's mathematically beautiful, but it does point to this tendency that I think we've seen, particularly in the 20th century, to develop theories of everything and what I would call universalism, which is this yeah. idea to try and describe the world in just some very simple abstract model. I mean, we've spoken with Stephen Wolfram. He's, he's another great example of this. Mm. Even um, Carl Friston had, you know, people have argued that the free energy principle mm. is a form of universalism. And um, why, why, why do you think there is such a tendency to try and reduce the world in this way? Well, I think it's, it, it's a great trick if you can pull it off, I suppose. So it's not obvious to start with that... Um, Newtonian mechanics or something close to it is a pretty pretty good description of large amounts of reality, but my goodness, it is. So miraculously, it turns out that you know, planets and, and, and apples uh, obey the same laws. Fantastic. Um, so I think it's natural. It's a natural ambition to have, but I think it's also, in, in most cases, a hopelessly unrealistic one because the world is actually a, just a very uh, chaotic and complex place. And, and it's, it's essentially historical. So I suppose the universalist perspective is saying um, it's, it's started from the assumption that there are sort of deep templates which are not forged by sort of random historical contingency, and those mm. deep templates have, have got to be um, got to be found. Uh, but but the more you think of the aspects of reality you're interested in as historically contingent, and you know, like these are the charades we played, this is the way that the the, the um, our, our thinking took us. These are the environments we're in. This is how our bodies are constructed. These are the challenges we face. This is you know, this is the stuff that this particular group of people um, wanted to talk about. Here's their language. Here's another one. If they had even the same problems, face them again, they'd have come up with something else. Uh, it's just not, you know, it's just not going to be something that's, that, that yields to that to that strategy. Um, so I think, it, but 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 of course, our most successful uh, and sort of striking uh, theories in, in in science have that character. So it's very natural to want to emulate them. If I could think of a universal theory of language which works, I'd go for it. I just don't think it's possible. Yes. I mean, what I like about Chomsky's theory is, is that it's intelligible, it's high level, and it kind of, you know, carves up the world in, in an interesting way. Whereas, you know, um, Stephen Wolfram's theory, um, the, the content of the universe is still in the emergent complexity, even if it can be constructed from simple mm. um, building blocks, which I guess would distinguish it. But... Um, we should we should move on a tiny bit. So um, my very good friend, Professor Mark J. Bishop, um, we both read your book at the same time and we were messaging each other on LinkedIn, remarking on, on your book. And he says he started the book and um, a couple of things cropped up for him was that um, he thought you were focusing on an anthropomorphic aspect of language and he cited Ferdinand de uh, Sursa. Mm. So he defined language as an internalized system of symbolic units defined by their intra-systemic relations. Um, following Roy Harris, um, uh, who's, uh, he's a fan of, of Roy Harris, by the way, as a linguist who invented a theory of communication called integrationalism, which em emphasizes innovative partition, uh, participation by communicators. But he said he thinks to, uh, he prefers to think about language or languaging as a mode of exercising influence about an entity's future intent and he actually gave the example of imagine the embodied language of an operating theater where even the bodily positions of the nurses and the doctors and the technicians convey the meaning of a game you know in, in yeah. a kind of operation yeah. so w w would you entertain that kind of expanded view of the game yeah yeah no absolutely uh, indeed um i think that goes back to the wittgensteinian notion of course of a language game where um, Wittgenstein has a, a, an example of, of, of two people doing some building together. So 
you know, one person says slab, and it means something like, you know, I need a you know, slab over here to put, 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 put in position, or it might mean um, you know, that slab's the wrong slab, or it might mean you know, break a slab um, into pieces for me, or it could mean all sorts of things, and it'll be clear from the context, just as we, and the operating theatre obviously is a similar kind of setup. So sort of a, 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 a shout of you know, forceps or scissors or whatever, it's probably going to be have different meanings if you're you know, doing the operating versus um, if you're you know, cleaning up the instruments or something. Yes. Um, so so yes, I think we should always be thinking of the game as very much embedded, and we don't you know, we don't particularly um, emphasise this, but embedded in the, the sort of momentary interactions that you're engaged in. So and then it becomes even more clear that the 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 the, the work that language is doing. Is, is is always scaffolded by all of the other stuff. I mean, we're trying to we're trying to successfully do stuff together. We're trying to co have coherent coherent um, interactions where we you know, collectively operate successfully, build something, you know, how take turns and whatever it is, share things, cook meals, and that that that's the, that's the, the 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 purpose of having communication at all. Um, so, so yes, in some ways, the load that language is bearing is quite a light one. And, mm -hmm. and the more we have this other rich stuff, then the, the, the lighter it is. And I suppose the illusion is thinking, yes, but if you took all that away and just dealt with the null context, some sort of, you know, sort of free floating around in space, then if you just, you know, what would language mean then? To which the answer is, well, sort of nothing, really. Um, yeah. You take, take all the context away and you've just got you know, sort of empty, empty symbols. But on, on this anthropocentrism point, though, I, I think Mark feels that there isn't such a bright line between humans and animals and, and in the language game. I, mm. I, and the thing is, I, I was on board of, with your argument because you you are, I think, pointing out matter-of-factly that we have this social mimetic plasticity and complexification and animals don't. So it's not that yeah. they don't have a social world, but they don't have the plasticity that we have. I think that's that's right. So certainly anima, animals have communication systems, but they don't have communication systems that differ from one species to another so you know the the waggle dance of the bee for a particular system of species of bee will always be the same now you, you people sometimes say aha but wait a minute what about bird song bird there are birds which have variable songs but of course they don't actually have a communicative function yeah. so it's not that the bird is singing something and saying ah now you know over there there's some, you know, some food or um you know um there's no there's no there's, there's no sort of um confluence of flexibility and communicative function. That's the thing that, that that's amazing about people. So I do, yes, on, on that aspect of anthro, anthropocentrism, I think I'm I'm with it. So there's no analogue of the operating theatre for animals where they're, um, they're, they're engaged in some collective activity and sort of grunting and nodding to each other and those grunts and nods are being systematically interpreted. Or at least if there is such a, uh, a thing, we you know, that would be very interesting to discover. But I, I, think, I think that's... That would be a non-standard perspective to think that there's non other animals other than us who can do that. Yeah, it, it's weird because I was reading that Max Bennett book, and and he talks about Machiavellian apes. So they they do develop sort of like plastic behaviours, but then but the, the 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 templates are not shared memetically. I think that's the difference. Mm -hmm. GPT three can write short stories, technical manuals, and press releases, and do other simple tasks such as answering questions. But GPT three is not mimicking the human mind. It has no mind at all. And you said to put it metaphorically, human language is to GPT as the horse is to the motor car. Horses have indeed been replaced by motor cars and buses and trains as the most efficient uh, uh, means of human transport. But they're um, scarcely artificial horses. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think that I think that is right, really. So I'm I'm not as worried about the singularity as many people. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll give you my, the, my my positive perspective, which is. Don't worry about the singularity, we're okay. But also I'll just add a note of caution because I feel a bit more cautious these days. Uh, so the positive perspective is I think, the, yes, the idea that the ability to, to answer uh, questions in natural language is somehow the sum total of human intelligence I think is, 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 a, is a fundamental mistake. And an interesting question to ask oneself is if um, we allow large language models purely to talk to each other for, for, the, for, for forevermore, how far are they going to get? Like, what, are they, what new things are going to do or invent? Mm. Nothing is my suspicion. Yeah. So they're just pumping out. They're, going, they're taking our language. They're pumping it back out, and then just pump it back in and out and in and round it'll go. And we're going to get absolutely nothing new. Whereas humans are creating new culture and um, uh, new, new inventions, new ways of doing things all the time. Uh, of course, obviously these models aren't engaging in 
in, in acting in the world as well that they perceive but irrespective of that um they're, they're just not you know they're, they're, they're in a kind of echo chamber so we can create uh, a culture which they can um reflect back at us but that's that's just reflection and you might say well we aren't we doing that well i think to some extent not we are of course we are hoovering up information and we are able to uh, reflect it back at each other but we're also able to yeah, we're, 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 we're sophisticated reasoning beings who are actually able to generate new ideas and thoughts. And so I, I, I think, you know, I don't think, I don't think we should be too worried. I think this is a very narrow, though impressive, um, achievement. So that's my positive sense that you know, we're, the, the, um, the thing is that these, these systems cannot, in particular, play charades in a way that we can. Mm. Um, so the thing about human communication is it's not just all about um, firing back, uh, reflecting back things that have been said before. It's about solving problems in particular situations in creative, clever ways. And this is not yet what these systems can do. And maybe maybe it's very, very far from what they can do. So the sort of the thing that makes humans remarkable is that with practical objectives and goals in front of us and a language at our disposal, we can you know, say intelligent things and work together in a, in a creative, flexible way, which is you know, not, um, yeah, it's not, not, not just a generation of abstract text. A quick point on that, though. So th these models are now embedded in our cognitive nexus, and they are um, they are referred to as generative AI. And people even think of them as being a creative thing. And I can understand why people think that. You can put any input into GPT, and people think that you can kind of explore the space of any possible output. But of course, that space is constrained perniciously by data and model bias and various weird motifs mm. that are baked into the model. And um, so I think in, in many ways, having these things embedded in our cognitive nexus will kind of constrain our creativity in a very kind of pernicious way. I think we have to worry about that for sure. Yes. I mean, if we're all, it's a bit like, it's a kind of more extreme version of um, if everyone uses the same search engine, we all find the same things when we're interested in the same topic yes. and all the yeah. other stuff gets kind of lost. And if we, it becomes even more dangerous if we have the, the same essentially the same summary paragraph keeps coming out of us saying oh, the, the way to look at this is this and these are the crucial issues um so i think we should be very cautious i think pe people doing research um very rarely get sensible answers out of large language models so if you actually have something tricky that you don't understand then asking asking a large language model is almost invariably just gives you a, a pile of stuff which is exactly the stuff you didn't understand in, in a slightly random order it's not that the large language model has you know, sort of solve the puzzle that you were struggling with. It's not said, oh, yes, I was wondering about this too. And in fact, the answer is this. It never does that. It just gives you the, the salad of various odds and ends that you don't quite you know, know what to do with. So it, it's not, I mean, you know, it'd be an awful lot to ask for it to, to sort of solve all our problems for us, but it but it isn't doing that. Um, so so I am, yes, I'm optimistic that if you if you think, I mean, to, to build a, uh, a system that's really going to, contribute to you know, a, a human society at the level of a fellow human being then it's going to have to be engaging in this charade like behavior it's going to have to be able to have conversations with us in in embedded in the world we're in helping us do the things we're th 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 doing having struggling with the problems we're thinking about and wrestling with and the context we're in as well as just firing back sort of disembodied streams of um, of text so that's my so my positive view is you know, machines don't large language models don't play charades they're, n they're nothing like as smart as we are i doing something very different so just quickly ahead, yeah. not on that yeah. but do you need agency to play charade well um, well i mean i don't know um well, how we tie it to agency i'm not sure um it, isn't but, that isn't that a fascinating thought yeah it is it is very interesting i mean it, it, in, 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 I, i've sort of my instinct would be to play charades well in a sort of consistent way you need to have um a sense of your joint understanding with the other person because you have to have a sense of these are the things we know in common if i do these actions that will remind you of the same thing that would remind me of if i were in your shoes and that's going to be that, that and that's going to trigger the thoughts that it would trigger in me so we've got to have some sort of sense of common understanding of the world so it's an interesting question whether you can actually do this without essentially being um, yourself something awfully like a human intelligent agent. Um, yes, and and, and I, I use the word agency, but a deflationary word would be to use divergence. There, there's something about a divergent search process accumulating mm. these epistemic, you know, nuggets of information, putting them back mm. into our um, information ecosystem. It feels like if we had 
a like a monolithic centralizing algorithm, it wouldn't have the same characteristics. Well, I think any monolithic centralizing algorithm is going to lead, um, yes, to sort of a, a, a centralized and standardized way of seeing the world, which will be very different. Will not not lead lead us forward as a as a society. So, I, yeah. and this is this is a sort of general point about distributed computation. I suppose you need um, to have large numbers of a, a agents thinking in, in divergent in different ways. And the evolutionary process um, generated by those divergent thoughts uh, and, 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 and perspectives will, and for some of which will be abandoned, most of which will be abandoned, other of which will, other, others of which will catch on. That's actually the process to, to search a large, that's the way to search a large space of, 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 of an open-ended space of interesting possible things to think about and do. Whereas yeah. once you've of, of centralized this in, in, in one giant, echo chamber then then you're, you're we're in trouble um yeah but 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 just to bring it home i mean I, so x risk people worry about the singularity and i think the I think recently they've cannibalized AI ethics and governance and they're they're moving away from the previous mono um, maniacal AGI that's going to kill everyone and now they're talking about mimetic intelligence which is the same thing we're talking about mm. but um I mean, I don't know whether whether you think that the monomaniacal superintelligence is even possible, but if we are talking about the mimetic collective superintelligence that we already are a part of, mm. presumably you don't think we need to worry about that killing everyone. No, no, I think I don't. So the the, the monomaniacal um, in superintelligence, I I'm basically not that worried about. But the staggering effect of, effectiveness of large language models has slightly shaken my confidence. Um, so I, I suppose. One thing is we should always be suspicious of any any confident feelings we have about anything. You know, obviously we we're, we're all we're always making errors all the time about these things. We're always thinking no one will need more than th the world won't need more than three computers and all sorts of the Beatles. Where you know, guitar groups are on a way out. We don't need the Beatles and all of these you know, pr pronouncements that have been made throughout history with great confidence by people with great expertise and turned out to very rapidly to be total nonsense. That we should always be doubtful about those thoughts. And in particular, if you'd if you'd asked me. 20 years ago, say, or probably 10, um, would it be possible in the 20, uh, 2024 to create models which can chat about any topic, can write, write a poem about any topic, can uh, de decide to, um, can be instructed to respond without using the letter B and, and so on and so on. I said, no way, no way, that's <laughs> never possible. You must be totally joking. Like, to, to go to the 22nd century, what are you thinking? And and I, I was completely wrong. Now, I'm not sure that the people who developed large language models had a particularly different intuition either. Um, or if they did, yeah, maybe just the personality trait, more like, just more of optimistic characters. But no one really could see the path, I think. No one could see, oh, yeah, we're kind of here. And if we just move a bit further along, suddenly... Um, these problems are going to be solvable. It's just, it's sort of miraculous. I think it's an amazing thing that they've proved to be solvable. So, I suppose mm. I've slightly sh been shaken in my intuitions about you know, where what's near and what's far. My, my I suppose having lived through the sort of good old fashioned AI um, period, the the story for such a long time was. Oh, massive changes around, around, around the corner. Amazing things are about to happen. Oh, no, they didn't. Oh, no, they haven't. No, still that, still that happening. They're just about to happen. We'll give it a bit more time. And neural networks, of course, look like they were part of this. Coming in, in, in you know, even in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I remember seeing Jeff Hinton give a talk in 1985 and being astounded by it. I'm just amazed. I just thought, this is, this is the most wonderful, wonderful stuff. But um, the idea that we get to a point where suddenly all sorts of applications and all kinds of um, capacities are emerging that no one really saw coming. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm just a little bit less gung ho and relaxed than I might have been in the past. But 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 ironically, it's apparently intelligent, but not intelligent. And you know, but you yeah. know, you could argue it's just the McCord duck effect. You know, you're just moving the goalposts and, and everything. But it, it feels to me that while it's a miraculous achievement and what OpenAI mm. are doing with the generative vision models, it, yeah. it's, it's fantastic. Mm. But I still don't see a path to it dramatically changing the job market because no, you still no. need agents no. doing things. They can use, th these things are tools, right? They don't do anything on their own. No, no. I mean, of course, tools can change things very drastically over time. I mean, language itself, of course, from the 
languages uh, languages Girard's perspective and indeed from lots of perspectives is a in a way the most spectacular tool of all and that has changed what's possible for humans to do yes. over long periods of time and you know, I suppose you might say well when mathematics first started up it seemed pretty pretty impractical didn't seem to do very much of any use um, and so probably in the long term and maybe it's not we're not talking about centuries here we may be talking about shorter term, term than that then the these systems will will radically change what we can do um but like you i am skeptical of the immediate uh, totally revolutionary impact that these models are going to have on our lives i think there's going to be um it's a bit like sort of google search with with bells on uh, from a practical point of view as a piece of technology it's miraculous and i think it's actually giving us probably deep insights into the way brains and intelligent systems can work which we didn't have before so it's incredibly exciting it's very exciting to be alive at this time it's a, it really is a massive um you know it's, it's, it's a massive intellectual shift and i'm sure um i hope i very much hope there are people around in many centuries to come and if there are that i think they will look back at this as, a, as an absolutely seminal moment and they won't, they won't won't be forgotten and lost in the mist of time this will be you know, massively I mean, viewed as massively significant um but it isn't i think it's not the emergence of uh, it, it's not the emergence of a new species of, of intelligent being uh, it's, it's going to be living alongside us anytime soon nick chater it's been an absolute honor to have you on the show thank you so much it's been a great pleasure thank you so much tim wonderful right great stuff I'm that's brilliant